So we're going to jump right in. I do encourage you all to use the, um, the chat area to create community as we learn with and from each other. Introduce yourselves. Feel free to place into the chat your LinkedIn information that allows us to stay connected. And if throughout our time together today, we say something that resonates, place it into the chat. If you have a question, we, or we love questions, certainly place that into the chat. And we just look forward today to um, really good dialogue. So as per usual, I wanna take you through a couple of quick slides to set us up for today. So go to the next slide for me, please, Natasha. And by the way, I always like to recognize my team who are backstage serving in the producer fashion to help ensure that we have a good experience today. So thank you to Natasha Portskova, DEI manager, to Lindsay Morton, a DEI coordinator with NWC. And we also have Lauren Decay that's joined with us today, another DEI manager. And so I'm super excited because we have some great co-hosts that are going to be joining us in 2021. And um, next Friday, January the 22nd, we have Brian McComack that's going to be our guest co-host. And um, that session is actually going to be led and hosted by Natasha Portskova, the name that I just mentioned, our DEI manager. And in that conversation, they're going to be talking about invisible, diverse identities and being inclusive of people with disabilities, both in our actions as well as in our language. So be sure to join us on January 22nd from 11 to 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. Next slide, please. And the week after... January 22nd, on that next Friday, the 29th, we are going to have, oh, my dear friend, Karen Hines. And um, Karen and I are going to be talking about how to personalize diversity, equity, and inclusion plans. So individual development plans that we can enact for ourselves to help us to really reach our full potential and power to impact change. And so look forward to having Karen Hines on January the 29th. Now, it does me such great pleasure to get us to um, the part of today's event where I can introduce, officially introduce, our guest um, co-host, who is none other than Rakay Harris. Mm -hmm. And Rakay currently serves as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for Millican, a global industrial manufacturer. She has been with the company for 15 years and recently celebrated three years of having a DEI strategy for the organization. Every day she strives to foster an environment where every associate feels valued, respected, and engaged. She is passionate that all deserve an equal opportunity for development and advancement. She is also a 2005 graduate from Wofford College, Go Terriers. Rikay attended on an athletic scholarship for basketball. Her personal hobbies include working out, playing basketball, tennis, and running. Her favorite food of all time, she wants us to know, is pizza. And she also serves as an elder at New Life Church in Spartanburg, South Carolina, which is also the church that I proudly attend and um, that's under the leadership of Pastor James White Jr. And so as Anna and I welcome our guest co-host, Rakay, let's just show her some appreciation into the chat. Many of you I know are from Millican, so I'm sure Millican is here in full force. <laughs> and we love that. So um, be. welcome, Rakay. <laughs> hey, thank you. Wow. Thank you. How are you? Hawaii Consulting Team. I am good. I am good. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it in this lane right here. I, um, You're moment, fine. From the moment you started these uh, conversations, I was like, that's that's my friend. Oh. Connections are aligned. And so I was like, I got to go. I'm going to try to get on the Nika White show. <laughs> without, You're so funny. <laughs> without saying ups. Nika, Nika. <laughs> Me on like, I, didn't, I didn't want to do that for you, tapping into the network, trying to ask for favors, but I'm glad that you uh, extend the invitation and my time is here. So I'm looking forward to the conversation for sure. Oh, we are as well. We are as well. So I have to just go ahead and share this tidbit. And I said that I was not going to do this, but, you know, Rikay has already forced me to a place where I need to do this. Rikay and I go way back. I know her very well, not only on a professional level, because, of course, we're in the same space. And, and Nico White Consultant has also had um, the privilege of being able to work with Millican, especially on their journey and getting their DEI work started. Um, but Rikay and I know each other incredibly well. And so she's silly. I'm going to put that out there. She is silly. And for those in the audience that really know her and her personality, she has no choice but to be true to who she is. And so I said to Rikay, yes, bring your authentic self. We want all of that. And so you you are free okay. to, um, to certainly be who you are. Okay. 
<laughs> okay, fantastic. So now we've heard your official um, bio and all of your accolades, but we always start with asking our guest co-hosts to mm -hmm. share with us their story. And again, these are the things that people cannot read in your bio. And so what is your story, Rakay? I know, wow. So I am originally from Indiana and uh, like they all they already read, I came down here to South Carolina on a basketball scholarship and the weather has kept me here. Um, but prior to that, I mean, predominantly grew up in a single parent home. And so with, you know, hopes and dreams and aspirations to, you know, have a, a nice advancing career, I knew that college was going to have to be free for me. I just did not want to uh, add the weight uh, of finances to my mom. And so she had to be my basketball coach, cheerleader, uh, rebounder, right, to help, you know, sharpen the skills so that college would be free. So grateful for that. And that competitive drive um, in that nature has certainly um, landed me where I am today. So I do not take that lightly. So it doesn't matter what it is, I'm going to strive to be the best. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity to push Milliken to be the best that we can be um, advancing individuals, making a, a better company and ultimately impacting our community. I will add to Nika's point that I do think low key, I'm a comedian. I mean, this <laughs> <laughs> this DE and I stuff doesn't work out, or if I just simply throw in the towel, I am going for the big stage, and I've been working on a little bit of material here uh, that I think I got enough um, to to certainly make some laughs. And I think if Raven is out there, if I had a dollar for all of the laughs and smiles that I brought in 2020, I definitely would be on the big stage by now. <laughs> you know, I have no doubt about that, really. I think in some regards you have missed your calling, but um, I also know how effective you are at this work of DEI. So who knows? But, you know, blending the two, I think I think that's a good look for you, especially considering that this work is so hard. Sometimes we have to just take a step back and make sure we're enjoying life. And so that's what I appreciate about you, Rike. Yeah. Um, so let's let's kind of jump right in. What has pushing for DEI? Why has pushing for DEI seemed to become so much of a political now conversation and stance? Is it in fact political from your vantage point? So we okay, we just we're, we're jumping we're right, jumping in, right yes. in. Okay, okay. <laughs> Short answer for me, no. I mean, this work is not political. I mean, if you can see how you know the, the work aligns, right? If we are effective as DEI practitioners, we're helping to influence decisions um, that ultimately make for a better company and community, right? Politics are basically activities and decisions made to ensure that people can live in peace and harmony, right? So as practitioners, we're kind of operating in that same uh, with that same agenda. But when I go to sleep at night, I'm not saying did I help advance the red box or the blue box? I'm trying to advance the people box. So I do not feel at the end of the day that I am a politician. Now, with that being said, you asked why does pushing a DE&I agenda seem political? And I'm gonna try to, because I got bills. Um, let me see how, <laughs> all of a sudden, me personally, uh, the two um, initiatives no longer seem to align. The synergies that used to exist, pushing for the greater good to ensure that we all can, can be valued, respected, have some sense of belonging um, in this country, there seems to be a, a difference there, right? And so I'll, I'll allow you guys to interpret whatever that difference may be for you. So when you have a administration that is you know, seeking to reverse, dismiss, reject, overturn a lot of the work that business leaders and DNI leaders have, have justly fought for in response to a business need, right? Affirmative action, LGBTQ inclusion rights, now an executive order to basically dismantle diversity and inclusion education, immigration laws, right? When you have an administration that's pushing a different agenda than what used to align with DNI, it looks like now it's a political game. What it's really not, if we are all focused on human decency and again, striving for peace and harmony where people can just agree to be together, the agendas should align. So the question I would, the follow-up question, which would come in our uh, offline VIP conversation, because I got bills, but the follow-up question, why is that part of the argument? What has changed in, in the previous years that now make pushing for uh, human rights and human decency and a sense of belonging makes that seem political. 
No, I, your, your response is so spot on. Um, I couldn't have said it better myself. And I appreciate you really leaning into your vulnerability to make that statement. Cause I think it's an important conversation to have. I'm looking at the chat and my colleague, Lauren Decay says, if people stayed as political, I feel it's an avoidance tactic. And that is spot on. You know, we have to realize that this, this work impacts every single aspect of society, every institution, every organization, every place, every space. And so it's definitely about advancing the people box, which Chris amplified into the chat. So I can certainly appreciate your answer. Yeah. I wanna give my colleague, Anna, a chance to kind of jump in on this conversation. So Anna. Yeah, um, Rick, hey, I, I had a question. You used the words practicing while black <laughs> and <laughs> Will you talk a little bit about that and, and, and tell us what that's been like for you, especially, you know, given the current moment? Right. Woo. One word. Ex <laughs> exhausting. Yes. Last year about took me out and I went to um, the beauty salon a couple of weeks ago. And y'all can't see it right now, but it's more gray hair than I have ever had uh, in my life as a result of the past couple of years. And we were cracking jokes, but essentially it's exhausting and i you know give kudos as we're moving into mlk day weekend and you know celebration i i cannot imagine you know being a dr king or an angela davis and and the list goes on right other civil rights leaders but just pushing this initiative and seemingly no progress has been made right and so for me the frustration was I'm trying to com compartmentalize my own personal trauma, right? Um, triggered by the, the killing of George Floyd and then, you know, other scenarios, the con conversation continues, right? So I'm trying to deal with that while also having to be the go-to person, right? For, within my organization or just in general. I did not, there were days, you guys, when I just did not have it in me to ask more questions about what can I do? How, how are you? Uh, why does this keep happening? Like. I just want to put a sign up that just said Google and then just close my office because I literally was just frustrated of having this conversation when in 2020 and in 2021, seemingly continuing to see systemic racism, overt discrimination and white privilege just go unchecked. And so that was bothering me and I was kind of losing hope. And is it worth, you know, fighting this fight? But Clearly, I was reminded of my why. You know, we're going to keep pushing. I called Nika one day and was like, uh, what you got? Because I need, give me something to keep going because I'm on the brink of pursuing my comedian career. <laughs> there was a day uh, and, uh, when I was like, you know what? I'm going to work on my jokes because this was, it was frustrating to me. So I was, I was trying not to implode and still be that go-to person and trying to balance that was very, very difficult. So practicing while Black that is, that is what I mean. Maybe okay, I thought, maybe you can have, sorry, Nika. I was going to say, no. maybe Rike could have a webinar, Overcoming Adversity Through Comedy. Something <laughs> like that. I love it. We can do that. that. We can do that. <laughs> yeah. And Anna, another thing, I am, this is going to sound horrible, but 2020 had no other choice but then to allow me to work from home. I'm not sure because I there were days of tears and anger and frustration and I got to yell in my empty house and no one would think that something was wrong with me. I'm not sure I would have been able to put on the best Riquet in a professional setting dealing with everything that was transpiring in 2020 and effectively do my job. Right. So I, I appreciate being home. No one is distracting me. I can do what I want, say what I want, vent because we're still dealing with a lot of racial inequalities in our country. But did you yeah, feel- topic... <laughs> so, I'm so sorry, Anna. Go ahead. Have so many questions. Rikay is like, I, I love it. I love her energy. It doesn't translate over email, Rikay. I guess. <laughs> 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 oh. I was gonna ask Rikay, you know, um, in 2020, I know it was such a difficult year for, for many of us. Um, a lot of us, but um, as a DEI practitioner, especially, did you find that it was easier because people were maybe more open to yeah. understanding or was it harder? Man, uh, it's a mix of both. Um, I can certainly see both sides. I'll, I'll go both angles. I know I'm not supposed to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but here we go. So I can see why it could have been easier because there, like I said, there was a lot of material in 2020. 
months, right? So you you got some things to talk about, right? 2020 essentially slowed everyone down. So we couldn't like the business of life just wasn't there. So we had no other choice than to pay attention to what was going on around us. And that those uh, scenarios required conversation, right? So the more you had conversations, the more it was like, we've got to do something, or at least that's what should have happened. So I feel like 2020 set practitioners up to engage in these conversations easier, right? Because it's happening and everyone's watching. Now, some might be more, that's fine as well. I say it, it was slightly more challenging for me, again, just because I couldn't believe that we were still here, couldn't believe this was happening. Um, but Mil we were in a good place. 2019, the engagement was high, momentum going into 2020. We were looking to make huge impacts right in our community. And then it just kind of like it halted. So I had to get creative over a virtual, virtual platform, just like <laughs> you guys. Right. And try to figure out how do I keep the energy through a virtual setting. So that was kind of like the biggest challenge of wanting to make sure that we didn't drop the ball because, you know, once this work stalls, it's hard to pick it back up. That's awesome. So I want to jump in here and and maybe selfishly, I, I will admit that I have to go back to practicing while black because <laughs> I'm black. <laughs> and I am I am in this space and I have deep convictions about this work and and I feel like all practitioners in this space carry that load um, in a way that presents triggers all day long oh. because we're holding space for others and we're helping to educate others, which means we're suppressing our own feelings and our own thoughts. And, um, and that's hard. I often like to share the story and, and um, actually this friend is, is joined today with us, um, but this was right after um, George Floyd's murder where everyone was really just inundated and, and exhausted and trying to find ways to be called to action that would lead to some level of meaningful impact. And it was hard, we were all grappling. And I was doing tons of like these courageous conversations, safe space, you know, convenings and, you know, and they often would become quite emotional. People were encouraged to be present with their emotions and to lean into their vulnerabilities. And so you had lots of dialogue that was coming forth that people did not know what to do right. with it. So so as, as I, as a practitioner, was really navigating all of that, I was really bearing the burden, I felt like, in many regards. And I was not taking notice of what that was doing to me personally as a practitioner, as a Black right. practitioner in this case like that. And I had a friend, we were starting a meeting or a session and immediately, you know, she let in with, how are you doing? And I, you know, the same, you know, response that's normal. Oh, fine. I'm good. I'm well. And she stopped and she said, no, Nika, yeah. I see you. And in that moment, I broke. Yeah. I, I mean, like tears were flowing and I couldn't catch my breath. And it was just all because of the realization that somebody simply saying, I see you, I hear you, I recognize and let go of some yeah. of that. And that was such a huge, um, a huge help. And, and even to this day, I still continue to tell that story. So she knows who she is and she's on this call today. Just know that I appreciate you. But um, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious um, to know how in which you have been able to combat that, um, recognizing that so many people do depend on you to help lead Milliken, right. you know, to a place where you also need to be mindful of I can't pour from an empty right. cup. And there's some things that sometimes it's going to cost me to have to take a step away. No How do you do? Great question. And so I will um, <laughs> respond with an acrostic as I would simply encourage everyone to rest. Um, and by that, the way I dealt with it, um, the R was to stick to my routine. Um, when, when I first left the office, I felt like probably like many, oh, this is going to be a month, maybe two months. We're going to come back. So pizza, started eating more pizza than I should have, started to, um, the junk food increase. I don't really carry a lot of it, but my closet was full of like food that is like never there. I started getting out of my routine of what was to me. And so that was kind of getting me off balance of being the Rake that I know I could be. And so I had to look, the world is different. I can still monitor my eating because I'm working from home. This, the refrigerator is still here with the same food. I don't have to buy the junk, right? <laughs> Uh, I can still exercise and work out. It might look different, but I prefer to run outdoors anyway. So get back into my routine was, was, was important first and foremost. Secondly, E, where's my encouragement in, in my encouragement circle, my support group? So I 
a mm -hmm. a Milliken chat that's probably jumping right now because I mean it, it doesn't matter what it is. Happy birthday, how y'all doing? Like you said, just can we love on each other in this moment and and fill me up, right? Um, and so that kept me going as well as my family and I. We implemented a a weekly video call just to keep tabs on each other, pray for each other, etc. Um, and then while out or while taking this time, you know, the S is for strengthening my my toolkit, my skill set, right? What am I doing to sharpen and study to show myself approved, right, for opportunities like this? And while you're doing that, if you're 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 giving out, but I'm also being filled with right new knowledge, growing and learning and developing as a practitioner. And then T is be transparent, right? When 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 your friend calls you Nika, like it was like, nope, we're good. I'm fine. No, when you call me, it's gonna be like, thank you. <laughs> right, I just need a minute, and if but when you call, you need to be ready because you're gonna get it. And so I, I heard if nothing else in this time that I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm already real, right? That's why Nika brought me here. Uh, but I'm gonna be even more real. Like I don't want to hide if I'm dealing with something mentally and emotionally, and I'm just not all 100% here today. I want my teammates and colleagues to know that and understand why, so we can all talk about what we do to make it better. Um, and so I don't feel like I'm, I'm alone and, and on an island by myself. So I would say rest, get a routine, encouragement, strengthen your skill set, and then be transparent with where you are. And that certainly helped me. Really good advice. Really good advice. So I want to bring the audience attention to the fact that we do have a poll that's active right now. And the question is simply, was 2020 easier or more difficult for you? We do have a number of people that have already, already responded. Um, we're seeing um, that more difficult with 79% is leading. But um, for those who haven't had a chance yet to respond, I'd love to get your interaction there as well. So I want to now talk a little bit about your journey into this work because you know, your background has been yeah. HR. And it's common for a lot of individuals to not necessarily directly serve in the capacity of diversity, equity, and inclusion when they're in an HR function, although there's obviously lots of correlation there. But very specifically, the opportunity presented itself for you to gravitate directly into the DEI space. And so talk a little bit about that and um, what that process was, especially for those that are now entering mm -hmm. the space, or maybe they're in their organizations and they want their organizations to get to where Milliken yes. is right now to jumpstart this spark. And they're looking for advice as to yeah, how to Yeah, great do question. That. So I, uh, at the time, I was recruiting for Milliken. And so I was out selling the company, trying to uh, invite others to join this awesome organization. Um, and while doing that, I started to look around and I noticed, all right, at that time I was, you know, 12 years in and there are not a lot of people in the organization that look like me. So there was a personal passion to, to learn more about what other companies were doing to, to help diversify the space and, and be more inclusive. And so I just started to engage with Nika and then had other conversations with other business leaders to find out what are you guys doing, right? And so the more I learned, the more I loved. Um, and it was sharing the information and, and the data with my um, HR leader at the time. And it was like, let's do this. And I was like, all right. And so... I did it while recruiting, right? If I'm gonna bring the problem, I guess I'm gonna to have to be part of the solution. And so I essentially recruited myself um, into this particular role and have loved uh, the three year journey that we have been on. And so we started just very, you know, uh, fundamentally, foundationally with education and awareness. Why are we doing this? Why is this important? How does this help Milliken? And I think engaging in those initial conversations um, will get more hands involved that will simply say, how can I help and move this initiative forward. So um, yeah, I saw a need, a personal passion, and, and it grew from there. No, that's awesome. And so um, would you say that this somewhat kind of found you and then you, you mm -hmm. saw it as an opportunity and then just really, you know, saw fit to try to lead this for the yeah, organization? Yeah, I would definitely say uh, it just kind of stumbled upon it, right? It found me, I found it. And then it was just like an awesome connection because, again, I know I recognize that in all humility, I exist to make people better. Right. So that's in the organization or that was on the basketball court with my teammates or a Sunday morning sermon across the pulpit. That's just who Rick Hay Harris is. And so to find this role that now aligns basically with my personal passion was just like, a wow, let's do this. because I'm making an individual impact. 
and then we're going to influence our community. So that was powerful for me. So yes, it's exhausting work, but the drive and love that I have for it is what keeps me going. So if you can find someone in your organization, if it's you um, and you love this stuff and you like making things better, then get your hands dirty, um, get ready to be exhausted and wore out. But the the end game is so much better if, you, if we can stay committed and focused. So. No, I definitely agree. I'm going to let Anna jump in here um, after I make this quick comment. But, you know, that's that was my entry into the work as well. My background is marketing communications, but I saw such a huge need for greater intentionality around diversity, equity and inclusion with the organization that I was employed with at the time. And so I simply kind of raised my hand and say, I, I think this is an opportunity and this is what I think it should look like. And I was clueless at the time, but I have the wherewithal to put some really smart people in my camp that, that were quite successful in executing this work within their respective organizations. And, and that was really the start. And so I, I amplify yours and my story because there could be some people that's part of this audience today sitting back thinking, I wish my organization was much more forward thinking in their approach to DEI, but maybe you're waiting on someone else to take that step. That it's someone me. else could be you. Right. Yeah, it could be you. Anna. I actually loved what Rike said. She said she self-recruited herself. And realized the work was important, so she did it, and that's awesome. Okay, not a lot of people have the courage to just want to learn and take it upon themselves to educate and and learn and be the best at that craft. Thank you. Um, what What's next for Rike Harris? Like, what are you doing to grow this craft? And um, what else do you wish to um, learn and do in the space of DEI? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I'm probably going to run in 2024. I'm I'm thinking about it. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm not inside inside with a joke. I mean, but if I do run, I know that they will support me. But no, I mean, I really want to to make Millican um, be as best that we can, right? So we're pushing to um, you know have the we just launched our. LGBTQ allies network at the end, I say just, but it was at the end of 2019 leading into 2020, right? I forget 2020. Um, so now we need to start becoming a more inclusive community as it relates to uh, the differently abled um, or people with disabilities. That's a conversation for us that we need to, to bring to the forefront and start figuring out, you know, how do we um, ensure that we are again promoting inclusion for all. Uh, personally, I think for me, I just want to um, make sure that I'm always, you know, in the know of, of what's going on, right? So I'll continue to follow, you know, there are a couple of groups on, on LinkedIn um, that I'll follow to kind of get the latest trends, et cetera. But I want to be the best DE&I practitioner that I can be. So I've got to stay knowledgeable and perfect this craft in that way. So, yeah. That's awesome. We're going to go through a couple more questions, but I also want to make sure that I invite the audience and remind you that submit your questions as well. We do have our teams backstage that's curating all those questions that are in the chat and they are making sure it makes its way to us in our backstage chat so we can easily find those. And so we do welcome those questions. Go ahead. This Anna. is um, off our script, Nika, off of the questions we, we agreed on. But but I didn't go realize you came with such a comedian and now it's been in my head. I was... Um, the other day, you know, after what happened at the Capitol, so many memes came out of that of that attack. And, you know, some of them I found funny and some of them were just, I felt diminished the situation. And so, Ricky, what do you think of, I mean, so many, like you said, so many material came out of 2020. And a lot of, like, I feel like as a country, we cope with it through comedy, through memes. Right, right, right. How do you feel about, I, I guess, just, I don't know. What do you feel about all those memes and all that comedy? Did it take away? Right. I mean, um, so uh, this is probably going to be horrible, but right, we're, we're going here. Uh, but like the, the the one meme that sticks out to me, and it's it should not be funny. Let's start with that. Like, you know, the, the scenario, it, it's only funny because it's re reality. Like, it really happened. Right. And so I think that's the part that's like, wow, it really happened. But OK, it happened. But the meme for me is like, OK, I'm I'm I appreciated the seven free day trial of 2020. But I want um, right. Like we, we were just we were just on a high in 2020 and we 
good. We were engaged in conversations. I mean, people had shared things. I mean, at Milliken, we almost, you know, crashed Microsoft Teams because we had over 300 employees on our call to talk about how they were feeling, right? So we had heartfelt, thought-provoking thought -provoking conversations, and then work was being done. We were putting in new initiatives, et cetera, and then bam, it was like, happy new year. So you immediately, you're like, oh, did the six months mean anything? Because mm -hmm. um, here we are again. I was like, I was just like, Lord, not another 2020, right? <laughs> That's all I'm trying to trying to get through. So that the question could be, how is it practicing while Black in 2020? Clearly the same as in 2021. It's going to be hard. I love it. Yeah, I put into the chat that some of the memes were, were, were really funny, but in all seriousness, there were times that you were thinking, how can you make light of what's going on right now? But, you know, sometimes that that's our way of coping and really just getting through yeah. to your point, Anna. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes we have to find by any means necessary ways to remain hopeful as we're trying to navigate <laughs> through the chaos. And so, um, so let's talk about MLK Day, because, of course, it's coming up on Monday, the official day that many organizations will observe MLK. What does Milliken do by way of honoring the legacy of Dr. King? And um, so share with us a little bit about that. Yes. Um, so we do recognize it as a holiday. Um, it was not always a holiday for Milliken. I believe this is our either fifth or sixth year. So definitely grateful um, that has become something that we are able to celebrate. And so there's always um, a letter that goes out. Actually, our, our letter went out um, this morning from myself that just kind of speaks to Dr. King and his legacy and um, what he fought for and why we are still, you know, kind of um, fighting for racial equality as well. And so I will remind them of our Millican values. Um, and then we encourage everyone to kind of get involved with the MLK Week um, kind of activities that take place here in Spartanburg and how they can, we say it's a day, it's not a day off, it's still a day on, right? It should be in trying to reflect and support, you know, what we can do to make our community better. And so that's kind of where we are um, with honoring Dr. King. That's awesome. Awesome. Um, what do you think Dr. King is, is perceiving about Ooh. what's happening right now? <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, he probably in some of those memes. Uh, <laughs> it's weird. I mean, you know, has progress been made, you know, since the 60s? We can all agree, absolutely. Um, but it's always weird for two steps you take forward. There are moments, right, like last week, that make you feel like you just went five steps backwards. Mm -hmm. Part of the journey where I some days have to say, how can I do this? And, and I was trying to, you know, get grounded and find myself. And so I started listening to a whole bunch of, of, of Dr. King videos and clips over the past week. And if you guys, I mean, um, if I had sneezed, if you guys just have five minutes, put that in YouTube and check that video out. I'm telling you, it will bless your soul. Um, he talks about when he got stabbed um, and if he had sneezed, he essentially would have died. But we're grateful that he did not sneeze because all the work would not have, you know. So check that out. But there was another one where he just asked the rhetorical question of how long? And even in that time, he said not long because a lie cannot last forever. But here we are in 2021, and it, there's a little bit of that lie still lingering out there. And so I'm trying to encourage myself in the spirit of Dr. King, how long I'm going to challenge myself to believe that it's not going to be much longer. Um, as we are all continuing to, to engage and advocate for change together. It cannot I won't. Again, I will pursue comedian uh, a comedic career because I'm not going to be able to to uh, sustain this much longer. So. <laughs> So we do have a poll, a new poll that's live now. And the question is simply, does your organization observe MLK Day? And the options are yes, no, taking the day off for myself, I am self-employed and observing, or I am self-employed and working. No right or wrong answers here. We just want to see um, where we are with um, these, you know, this particular question. And um, I want to make sure that we shift to a lot of the questions that are also being provided by our audience. And by the way, we are live on Facebook as well. So I always like to make sure that I acknowledge those that are there. Your comments are also being brought into the discussion here. So feel free to use the chat area or the comments area rather in, um, in Facebook. And so, um, Rick, I'm going to address one question and then Anna's going to um, get some of the questions prepared from um, the audience that have been submitted so far. But um, you and I both, we attend the same workshop 
membership place of service. We talked about that in the beginning when we did your bio, and that's one of the ways in which we've connected um, outside of just being in this space. And so we're both um, believers. And you know, while we talked about practicing while black, there's also a little bit to be said about practicing while serving as a Christian and a believer. And so just what are your thoughts about how you've been navigating that and, uh, and the implications, I guess, to the broader conversation that many are having when we yeah. know that, you know, so much really goes into play as to how in which you do this work? Yes, no, great question. Um, because I know I've had friends and family members that are asking, like, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> and I understand. Look, at the end of the day, I am not here, and I will tell, tell anyone, this is not about changing beliefs, your personal beliefs, your, your values. I'm not here to change that, right? I am essentially saying, at Millican, we're going to welcome all people and value and embrace their differences and perspectives. No one in our organization will be held back, discriminated against because of X. So I'm just promoting inclusion for everyone, right? Um, I, I know that there are some people that may not agree with everything. This is not a right or a wrong argument. I'm going to be okay, okay to agree to disagree with whatever your stance is. And I need to know that we can effectively still work together. But I think the, the challenge becomes where people feel like in order for this to work, we've all got to be on the same side. No, 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 no. I'm not advocating for you to change your mind about how you feel, but I am saying I'm going to dictate that behavior, right? So in these four walls, this is how we behave. And these these are our values and what we believe. And we get along with that. Um, but your personal beliefs, I'm not, I'm not asking you to change those. We're not going to argue about what you think is right. Hold your right for you and I'll hold my right for me. And we should be able to collaborate and still work together effectively. I love it. You know, we often say, you know, in NWC that acceptance doesn't always mean agreement. It just means that we've reached a place of professional maturity where we recognize that difference is just that difference, not good, bad, right, wrong, inferior, superior. Um, only the individual can determine what's really good for them, right for them. But it does not necessarily mean that we have to um, subject others to something that maybe we have mm -hmm. convictions about that maybe others don't. And so I, I think that's important in this broader context. And so I appreciate you um, leaning in and, and giving us your perspective on that. So it looks mm -hmm. like we have 84 percent of people um, that are part of organizations that observe MLK Day. That is that is tremendous. That's awesome. Um, I'll share a quick story about MOK, and then Anna will take some questions from um, the audience. But I was talking with my team backstage, of course, and Rickay was part of that discussion, but I shared. And those of you in the upstate, you will know this. Um, but Greenville was the last county in the nation to recognize MOK Day as an official holiday. And this was maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. It made national news. It was a really big deal. Jesse Jackson is actually from Greenville. So he was here a good bit leading marches. And it really divided um, the community. There was a lot of healing that had to take place. So once the holiday was officially passed by the county, um, many of us were trying to decide what can we do to bring about that healing? And we ended up founding MLK Dream Weekend. And for 10 years, so many different activities and efforts went forth to celebrate the legacy of Dr. King in really meaningful ways. But here's really what I want you to gravitate to. The very first year of having MLK Dream Weekend, we did a diversity banquet and there were hundreds of people that showed up for this event. And believe it or not, we were able to secure Dr. Bernice King as our speaker, Dr. King's wow. daughter. Can you imagine the last county in the nation hmm. on MLK Weekend to have Dr. King's daughter, Bernice King, to say, yes, I accept your invitation. I will be there in Greenville. And I never will forget her message was, the last shall be first. And that was so impressionable to all of the, us who were in that community, who were so emboldened to want to see change occur. And that message still is lasting. And so anyway, I just I just had to share wow. that with the group. Wow, that is so cool. Congratulations. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. So Anna, what questions do we have from this fabulous audience of ours? I want to be in Greenville for MLK 2022 <laughs> at a banquet with hundreds and hundreds of people. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, we have many questions, um, but this there's this one from Antonia. And the question is, I started my DEI role work from home and haven't had any experience of working in person with my company. Are there elements that you're looking forward to working in person? 
I mean, I, um, I thrive off of a live, uh, you know, engaged audience. And so I am looking forward to the day when some of these celebrations are able to happen um, face to face. Uh, but I, but I don't let that, you know, I don't let that stop the work that, you know, we're doing to advance the cause. And so I just have to um, be mindful that, you know, eventually that will happen. And in the meantime, trying to make sure that I'm, you know, the team and I, that we are creative and bringing kind of new flair, if you will, to our um, strategy. So it's, it doesn't go stale. And so people don't tire out and, and get bored and we'll continue to do that. But I would say for me, I'm just looking forward to a nice interactive DE and I education session where I can see you and look in your eyes and you can see me. And so you can understand, you know, how I'm saying what I'm saying and, and walk away feeling like a better Millican employee. So that's me. I don't know about, about you guys. What are y'all missing? I would say the same thing. Yeah. Um, it's definitely afforded us the ability to reach, you know, larger um, critical mass of people. But at the same time, there's nothing like that one to one interaction. I do miss kind of being on stage and being able to engage the wow. audience in a way that allows us all to, again, just share that that personal space. I think yeah. there's something to be said for um, how it deepens, I guess, the 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 mindset of, of being open, you know, to change right. when you're of in that that space and you're hearing it live and so i i do i do miss that i was yeah. traveling a lot before covid and all of it halted you know in march of 2020 yeah because <laughs> right now i see i mean i see the three of us right and i i'm just gonna make up a number there's like a thousand people out there no i'm just kidding i know there's not a thousand <laughs> people, right? but we're not able to like see how they react to certain things and get, you know their yes. mannerisms and understand because i mean and that that's just what i you know i thrive off of that so i'm, I'm missing that so much Okay, um, there's a question from Chris. I feel I've been personally mindful to take time off when it's needed. Some have taken time off, but there are some that are showing the need for more self-care and more work-life balance. I appreciate that some need work to be their distraction, but I'm wondering if you have creative ideas to better encourage people to take breaks, connect remotely with coworkers without mandating PTO use? I gotcha. No, that's a good question. Um, one of the things I just learned uh, for for myself in our um, Outlook email is that you can set up focus time. Um, I don't know. It's, maybe it's something I'm looking. I don't know. But anyway, I didn't learn that until this week. I know I'm uh, delayed on the email because I'm sure it went out months ago. But anyway, so one thing I, I hit yes. And so it will go and look on your calendar and find empty slots and just plug in focus time. And so I can use that time as a mental reprieve to catch up, to get my mind right, to focus or get prepared for the next meeting. Because let's be honest, there is a virtual fatigue is real. Um, so yesterday I sat at my kitchen um, table from eight until 8.30. That was a long day, right? That was a 12 and a half hour day of looking at a screen and literally hopping from one meeting to the next. Focus time will come in and say, you know what, you need a break, okay? I'm gonna put on your calendar. <laughs> so no one's had to mandate anything. Uh, now I can control it. If someone were to come through and say they they need me at that time, I can decide. But it will look blocked. So I would encourage people either use that feature or block your own calendar yourself and manually give yourself the space to breathe because we it's all needed, right? Um, and then I will say, when managers or leaders kind of, you know, echo that message as well. Like if they are pushing, hey guys, we recognize that this is a challenging season. I'm actually going to, to take the next hour for my own, you know, mental sanity. Then, then it frees others on the team to feel like they can do the same thing, right? And so hopefully there's a culture there that creates a space where people are able to take advantage of that time and not feel like they're you know, doing a disservice or cheating the company out of their out of time um, on the job, et cetera. So take the time, block it, get leaders to share the message and importance of self-care as well. And then I think you'll start to see people feel like they are free to take advantage of that. Focus time, but I'm so glad you introduced it. So let's get a poll going. How many know about, well, that's probably all of the, the know about it. 
<laughs> but look is time and outlook. We're gonna have to look yeah. into that. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody Bill can put it in the chat because I don't know what I just learned. I'm sure I'm months uh, late, but it blessed my life this week. It's great. Okay. Um, there are so many questions. Nika, do you want to pick one? <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so I'll go to this one is from Deborah. What is your advice for exploring DEI as an extension of uh, H an HR career? Um, and she also amplifies. She loves the idea of self recruitment. Right. I mean, you're already halfway there, right? With it, with an HR background, a people background, you understand the importance already as an HR manager of how do we make this uh, a trusting environment for our associates, right? Um, how are we uh, ensuring that our policies, um, procedures um, benefit our employees the best? And so I think DE&I work is really just an extension of that. And so for you, I would say, look at a lot of the, the work that's being done, to, done today and kind of identify some of those holes, some of those pockets um, where, where bias may reside, right? The decisions that are made um, how are they being influenced and, and the decisions that are made, who's at the table making those decisions? Um, I would say as an HR um, business partner, look at kind of the process of the hiring um, recruiting strategy, right? There are holes there, possibly. What schools are we going to, right? Look at that. I mean, um, what's, what's, what's really needed for the job, right? Or are our job descriptions maybe um, causing a, you know, adverse impact, right? Because of the way it's written. Things like that. So I think you can look at a lot of your processes, procedures, and try to, if you were looking at it, try to see where bias is a part of that decision making process and work toward ways to remove it. Share those messages with your boss. I think that's really good counsel, Rakay. And one of the things I would add to it is I, I think that what separates a lot of the DEI practitioners that are really looking holistically across organizations versus those where the role and the function is kind of housed within HR is that um, there's there's this broadened approach. You know, HR is or DEI is not just an HR function. It's, it's actually something that touches every single operations that are part of an organization. You know, you're purchasing a procurement process. Yeah, you have a supply. Yeah diversity effort? Are you making sure that minority women-owned businesses are in the consideration set for, you know, key, you know, opportunities? Um, it also extends to corporate social responsibility. You know, what are you supporting? And are, are you aligning yourself with efforts and organizations that are also in the space of addressing issues that are of concern to those that are most vulnerable in our community? And so it goes on and on. It extends to marketing communications, yeah, yeah. positioning and framing who you are and who you want to attract and reach. And so, um, you know, the other thing that I will add is I think it's not just looking at it from an HR lens, but it's also about looking at it across the entire um, organization to other areas as well. Yeah. Good ad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to jump to the fact that I see two more questions that so we're going to get there, but I just quickly wanted to address the fact that Millican is a global company. And so the work that you're doing is not just touching here in the States. It's also touching outside of the States. I mean, in fact, you and I have had a chance to travel together. Was it to Belgium? Is that where we went? Yes, yes. 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 And so, talk about how in which you solve for DEI, knowing that um, there there may be some commonalities, but th but there's also a lot of nuances within those global markets, of course. Yeah. So we definitely started um, when we started down this path. Our U.S. management diversity; um, those numbers were kind of like, aha, there's a problem there, right? So a lot of the work initially was focused at our headquarters in the U.S. But we are a global company, so we need to scale, right, and have similar conversations and training across every, you know, region that we are responsible for. And so there was an opportunity to, to learn um, as a practitioner, like regionally, culturally, what's, what are you guys dealing with? And how can I assist to ensure we break those barriers down um, in this particular region? And so I learned from my European colleagues, my Asian colleagues as well. Um, and then partnered with L&D to make sure that we customize training that would benefit their needs and kind of speak their language, still pushing the DE&I agenda across Milliken. So started here and then scale up and customize it to fit the, the regional, regional needs appropriately. I love it. Okay, so shifting back to some of the questions. Um, 
Let's see, we have one from Rachel, and she's going back to something that you said earlier today. Um, okay. The question is, is it okay to put that sign up physically, that sign that says, don't ask me to explain, Google it. Remember when you said that, comedian? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's resurfacing, comedian. So uh, what she wants to know is, does your organization support that? If that's something that's important for individuals to feel like the sense of belonging, what are ways that our organizations can support or make space for BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color to not have to bear the burdens on their own? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, no, that's a great question. Um, I would say I probably wouldn't put up the sign physically, even though I should, but I will be transparent, right? That goes back to my to my self-care uh, kind of acrostic with that T. I'll be transparent. And should someone come to me on a day where I am just not there, I'm going to have to let you know. Um, this is a, with all due respect, I can answer your question, is it okay if we wait until tomorrow? I am just dealing with a lot personally. I'm trying to navigate my own frustrations um, and, and confusion. And so I cannot right now. And I think we have every right to do that. And on the flip side of that, I think as we are growing and having these conversations and more allies are, are joining the conversation, they're hearing, right? A lot of people say, Woo, quit asking today or, or go to Google, right? And so now they're, they should be taking the initiative most days to at least Google something first and then maybe ask the question later. And I think when we have those conversations and allies are, are growing along their journey, um, I think that's helping create that that space where they're being able to kind of, okay, I can see Rikay, the eyebrow is raised today, so I'm not going over there right now. And I think that that's happening um, as we have more conversations. But great question, yes. Yeah. Put it up. I don't know if I would. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we all knew that you were talking just metaphorically, but it does amplify a really strong point, which is that the sensitivity that I think that people must have for those who are carrying this burden and doing this work to be able to step in. And one very simplistic way people can step in is to self-educate. The bottom okay. line is that resources right now abound. I will say that if we think about the silver lining of 2020 and even some of the recent events that have taken place, you know, earlier this week and last week, um, there is a plethora of resources out there right at our fingertips to help understand at a deepened level the severity of systemic racism, how it shows up. And, and even though it has evolved and it looks different, it still shows up across every system without exception. So do that homework for yourself. There's lots of resources. Agreed. And then I think, let's see, there's one more question for Antonia. Any recommendations for DEI practitioner networking groups? And um, I think that you mentioned earlier some groups on LinkedIn. Yeah, Link LinkedIn has a ton of them. Right, I know. Um, I think one of them is like global diversity leaders, uh, if I can recall. Um, and then just like uh, diversity practitioners, I think is the second one. But if you just type in diversity, you will see like several groups literally show up um, because there are a lot out there. But I... I think I know I'm a part of global diversity. I think I think it's a smaller one, um, maybe just diversity leaders or something like that. Yeah, LinkedIn is a great resource for connecting with other, you know, like-minded practitioners who can um, just help be a, a point of support. And that's the other thing. This work can feel quite isolating. And so right. if you, um, that's part of our audience today, if you are in that space for your organization and um, don't, don't feel like you have to carry that alone. I think that where I find a great level of value is being able to um, frequently to connect with others who are in this space just to... Um, be able to have those tough conversations, say, this is what I'm dealing with. How did you navigate this? Um, because right. it's so isolating. And so, so we're getting close to the top of the hour. I always like to give our co-host an opportunity to tell us um, some additional things that we have not had a chance to ask about and engage in. Are there any um, hot buttons for you right now that you're feeling really passionate about um, that you want to introduce to this audience? Well, I would just leave with kind of these parting words um, of my, um, you know, thoughts about if I'm going to pursue uh, my career as a comedian or continue to practitioner, right? And so, and it's like, go do it, right? Um, but I had to remind myself of my why. And so I wanted to really challenge or speak to, you know, those in this space that might be feeling extremely fatigued and worrying about, you know, how long. I want to remind you that it's not long. And so I will say that we have to continue to do three things. We keep fighting, right? Now, I'm not talking about go out on the streets and, you know, not that kind of fight, but keep advocating for change, right? Um, and then I will say stay focused. There is a lot of 
that's going on, it can cause us to get distracted. And when we get distracted, our work is stalled and then progress is not made. So some kind of way, keep the main thing, the main thing, right? We all know why we are here, what we're doing. I can control my sphere of influence. You guys control yours and then we'll continue to make impact for the greater good. And then last but not least, keep faith, keep hope alive, right? Um, I, going back to my question about Dr. King, he would have a, a small smile, but still be looking at y'all like, I know y'all not gonna stop. I know you better keep going. Um, and so we're all gonna have to keep that hope alive that says, you know what, you're right. There is still work to be done. And I'm not gonna punk out on this fight because I believe that change is gonna happen. And even if I don't see it in my lifetime, I know I'm making it better for those that are coming after me, so. I love, Rakay, that you're ending on hope because I believe we don't talk about that enough, especially during some of these dark days that we're experiencing. I think that if we lose hope, then that is going to place us in a position where we can't be called to action because we're going to feel right. defeated before we start. And right. so we need to have hope. And so I love that you've amplified that. Um, I always say that it makes us feel seen, valued, and heard when our guest hosts say, yes, I will be a part of your vodcast and I will share with your audience. And so we're so grateful for your time. We're grateful for your humor. We're grateful for your leadership in this space and how in which you continue to inspire so many others to also think more intently about out their inclusive leadership journey and just appreciate you being here. And um, Thank thanks, thanks to Milliken for allowing you the opportunity to come and share with us today. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. You're very welcome. And so I want to also thank my colleague, Anna, for being my co-host today as well. Um, one of the things that we're doing differently in 2021 is, you know, Nico White Consulting. It's not just Nico White. You're going to hear us say NWC more often than the full name. And it's because we have a group of very astute practitioners that are um, leading the charge every day with the work that we're doing with our clients. And so I'm so grateful to have teammates that are also um, facilitating the, the hosting role for our Intentional Conversations podcast. Um, I hope you all have a great weekend. I hope that you will find some time on Monday to do something meaningful so that Dr. King can smile, right? Um, but then also make sure you see it as an opportunity to kind of implement some type of self-care. This has been a tough, tough week for so many of us. And um, we want to make sure that we can be recharged and restored because um, our work is not done. Our work is not done at all. Um, I have to share this, y'all. My mom is on today, so I have to say hi, mommy. <laughs> I noticed for the first time as I was looking in chat, I saw Sharon Clean Scales, and so I'm giving my mom um, a special Aww. shout out. I love you, mom. Thanks so much for joining. Well, I think today. she came for me. I think she came for me. <laughs> She came for you. Okay. Well, we can share. Yeah, mom came for both of us, Rakay. But nonetheless, I, I appreciate your support, mom. And, and again, to each of you that show up week after week because you find meaning in um, being a part of this community, we value you. And we um, would love to get your recommendations for those you think would make for great co-hosts. Um, we really appreciate that. You can send that information directly to Natasha at NikaWhiteConsulting.com um, or actually NikaWhite.com. And we do vet all all of those um, recommendations. But thank you to our live Facebook audience. And I have to do this because today is J15. And for those of you who know anything about the pink and green and the illustrious sorority, the first and finest Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, I have to say pinkies up to all of my sorors. <laughs> I appreciate you 113 years strong. And we are wearing our pearls and our pink and green today, not only because it's Founders Day, but also in honor of Madam. Um, president um, elect or vice president elect um, Kamala Harris, who we're really incredibly proud of. And so wishing you all a great and safe weekend. And we'll be back here next Friday at the same time. Thanks so much for joining. Take care. <laughs>